Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm uh, Brahim Akulubali, a senior fellow and uh, the director of the Africa program here at Brookings. Uh, thank you for joining us for this exciting event on uh, re-examining trade with Africa under the continental free trade area. So we're particularly honored uh, to welcome to Brookings the deputy chairperson of the uh, African Union Commission, His Excellency uh, Kwerti Kwesi. Uh, it's a great pleasure working with uh, Ambassador uh, Shuyamburo Kwa to organize this joint event with the African Union. As you know, the mission of our Africa program here is to provide some evidence-based research to inform policy formulation in Africa and toward Africa, and to be an independent voice, a neutral partner, and broker for policy discussions on social economic developments of Africa. In this regard, our mission is uh, well aligned with that of the African Union, and our collaborations come quite naturally. As I look at the world today, I see that it's going through really great uncertain time, times of great uncertainty, to say the least. The rule-based international system, which has held the world together since World War II, is being undermined. Cooperation, which has been the hallmark of global governance structure, is under challenge, and free trade is under assault with the emergence of trade wars and other forms of protectionism. In these uncertain times, Africa needs more than ever before its institution to play a more assertive role in advancing the continent's agenda. And the African Union, the premier institution of the continent, is playing greater leadership on continental issues in ways that we had not seen before. We had the privilege uh, to welcome here last September, for some of you who were here, uh, President uh, uh, Kagame, to discuss the reform of the African Union. Our scholars had looked at the reform, studied them, and concluded that they were ambitious and they were bold, precisely the kind of reform that are needed uh, for Africa to overcome its challenges and unlock the continent's tremendous potential as well as turn the aspiration of Agenda 2063 into reality. The adoption of the historic uh, free trade area agreement is a testament to the AU's renewed assertiveness and determination to overcome the challenges that the continent faces. And it sends a strong signal that African countries intend to speak in a unified voice where their common interests are at stake. At the outset, I'm confident that Africa will overcome the challenge it faces because African countries are not facing any issue today which historically has not been faced and successfully addressed by other countries. And I do not see why Africa will be the exception. Excellency Deputy Chairperson, I congratulate you and your colleagues at the African Union for this historic milestone and for your leadership. With the passage of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, the time is right to have a conversation about its implication for trade with Africa and the implications for the existing trade arrangements, such as AGOA. So with that as background, we'll begin uh, our first session, which will be moderated by Professor Landry, uh, Landry Signe. So Landry is a uh, uh, David Rubenstein Fellow in our Africa program by way of introduction. And uh, he has uh, several accomplishments, uh, awards and recognitions, perhaps too many uh, lenders to list here. <laughs> uh, I just discovered this week as we were preparing for this event that another one of his affiliation is a member of the African Union Youth Advisory uh, Board. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, did, uh, he did assure us that that affiliation would not prevent him from asking tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then following this session, we'll have a moderated panel uh, discussion with the moderator, Whitney Schneidman, uh, who's a, a former State Department official and a, a fellow with the Africa program here at Brookings. So with that, I'll turn it over to Landry. Thank you. Thank you. 
speak from here, we'll speak from the podium. Oh, from here. Speak from here. Thank you very much, Gore, for a very kind introduction. Your Excellency, mm. thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. I'm particularly enthusiastic as I had the opportunity to interact with you uh, in uh, Ethiopia and mm. to see uh, your commitment for Africa's future. So thank you very much. Mm. As uh, all of you know, on March 21st, 44 African countries have signed the uh, framework uh, creating the African continental free trade area. Of course, removing uh, the goal is to remove tariff on 90% of uh, products and services to facilitate free trade uh, on the continent. However, in order for the African CFTA to come into force, 22 countries have to ratify it. Uh, as of today, about 49 countries have signed the agreement and six countries uh, have deposited their instrument for the African CFTA ratification. So some observers remain pessimistic about the prospect for both regional integration and uh, successf successful implementation of the African CFTA. And they use uh, past initiatives, uh, which they consider did good, look good on papers, however, did not go far in practice uh, to argue that the AFC, the African uh, continental free trade area is not likely to succeed. Your Excellency, why should we expect the African CFTA uh, to be more successful than the previous initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. And uh, let me, allow me to, is this thing coming across well? Allow me to thank uh, the organizers of this meeting. And uh, for me personally, it's a privilege to be in the Brookings Institution. This is an institution whose name one has heard about and read about even as I was growing up and doing uh, higher secondary education, I never in my wildest imagination thought I might be here addressing the Brookings Institution and people here. So let me thank you for this privilege. I, I believe that uh, if we want to talk about CFTA, we want to talk about integration, the need to integrate, the need to trade among ourselves, uh, which for me seems to be the most logical thing, one must begin to wonder why has it not always been like that? And the answer to this, you have to go to the history of Africa. Um, Africa has been termed various things. Uh, it's been termed uh, the eternal question mark. Kwame Nkrumah called Africa the great conundrum the eternal question mark, even the shape of the continent is a question mark with, uh, with uh, Madagascar as a dot. You know? <laughs> that uh, a continent uh, so well endowed, you know, for some reason, manages to be poor and destitute. And uh, it's almost inconceivable. Uh, you have seen Africans outside the continent performing very well, and you wonder how come that we never managed to get our act together. And the reason I, 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 I dare to suggest is lies in this history. And I, I want to say that if we say that um, we need to integrate, that in itself is an admission that we are somewhat less than integral. And Logically, we need to seek to locate the source of that loss of integrity. And perhaps we can begin to find answers to our problems. I believe in looking at phenomena in their history, their roots, their evolution, their development. 
So I want to suggest that the lack of integrity, the lack of the absence of Africans trading with each other lies in the colonial history, the Berlin Conference, we divided it up. I, I read something which was supposed to have been said by Albert Sarou, who was supposed to be uh, the French minister for commerce in 17th century somewhere. And he was talking about, he was defining what a colony was. And the point about a colony is for the colony to concentrate on producing one primary product to feed the metropole. And for the metropole to in turn provide everything that is needed in the colony. And beyond that, to prevent this colony from any interaction whatsoever with its immediate neighbors. So conceptually, walls were built between the various colonies in Ghana, for instance, where I come from, and that's what I know something about, uh, we're surrounded by Francophone countries, and we had very little to do with, with them. I remember one soccer match, there was a little confrontation on the field between a team from Ghana and a team from Cote d'Ivoire, and the Ghana said, what, what's going on? He said, they are speaking some strange language. This strange language is French. <laughs> you know, it just shows you the division between our people and the deliberate, consistent effort by the powers who held sway there to prevent their people to have, for having any interaction among them. So, and this has been replicated all across the continent. So trade and economic relations have been from the colony to the metropole and vice versa. And it is only at the point of independence that notions began, leaders began to meet each other, began to find they were, they had common interests and there was a need for them to trade together. I, I, I used to be secretary to President Mahama and we paid a visit to Cote d'Ivoire. And it was there that he saw a group of chiefs in Kente and he immediately assumed that these were Ghanaian chiefs. They turned out to be Ivorian chiefs, the same as Ghanaians. And it turned out to him, he found out that between his village and Al Alassa Ouattara's village in Cote d'Ivoire, were only 30 kilometers apart, they spoke the same local dialect. Still, they saw themselves as entirely different, but they didn't know each other. I'm saying that the absence of trade within and between African countries has its historical causes and historical origins. And it is only now that we are seeking to unravel those uh, walls that have been built, preventing us from interacting with each other. Physically, some of those walls are gone, but the, the, the greater walls exist in the minds of the people. So the CFTA, against this background, seeking to enlarge the economic space by removing those tariff barriers, because tariff and other barriers are examples of state policy. You know, I come from Ghana, when you're going to go to Togo, if you're trying to get an articulator load of goods to Togo, there's a roadblock, you go to the border, the border, by six o'clock the border is closed. The immigration officer says, I retail I about you. Uh, and level the shows. You're going to offload everything, you're going to respect everything, unless maybe you can give him some cents and fry or something. So the history has these inbuilt corrupt practices which are intended to prevent any interaction between them. So for 50, 44 countries to be able to sign a free trade agreement with the aim of removing these barriers for people to trade among themselves is a major step. Uh, statistically, it, it has been shown that we trade in primary products with the metropole, but whatever trade that occurs between us tend to be goods on which value has been added, they tend to be processed goods. And even if it's been shown also that if there's a, as little as a 2% increase in intra-African trade, GDP. Your Excellency. Rise by about 10, 10%. Sorry. On that note, following your, yeah. your explanation, yeah. how will we uh, measure uh, the African continental free trade area success uh, in the short or long uh, 
uh, term? In the short term, it can only be seen through an increase in trade among our people. And there's a concerted effort to remove barriers, both tariff and non-tariff, which kind of hinder and hamper trade between the two countries. And you notice that in our relations with Europe in this Lomé Convention, the, 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 the convention allows you to export primary commodities free of any excise duties to Europe. The moment you start to process and add value, the taxes come on. So Europe itself helps to consolidate and prevent Africa from trading within itself. So this process is now beginning. At least the law is passed, the various details, rules of origin, uh, sources and all that are being addressed. And I believe that as trade within Africa increases, specializations and comparative advantages will emerge. And it will be more interesting for capital exporting countries to now cite industries within the African countries. I'm beginning to imagine a situation where, for instance, creatively we can have um, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, the two countries together produce about 70% of world cocoa production. And you are told that, look, Cote d'Ivoire is producing a million tons. You have to up your production. The price falls and they don't understand. Now, they begin, they've signed a strategic agreement. They began to process together. Absolutely. Now, the more we process together, you could get China, for instance, to use their excess processing capacity to build factories around the borders. Because if they do that, they have a guaranteed market. They have a guaranteed source of prime products. And then you can have a situation where a billion Chinese kids are drinking chocolate every morning on a party. <laughs> uh, these, these are things that you can do. But you need to be creative, you need to be imaginative, and you need to be able to break the mold. And you can be sure that those countries that have fed fat and enjoyed what they call a chasse garé, the French call chasse garé, you know, chasse gardé, uh, this is your special hunting ground, they're going to face competition there, and it's going to open it up. And then in the process, you find more interaction. You know, we have a situation in West Africa where uh, this unemployment is rife. You find um, Ghanaian graduates are unable to get jobs. They form the, a society, they call themselves Society of Unemployed Graduates, replete with a chairman, president, secretary, and all that. You have a similar situation in Cote d'Ivoire. Now, if you have a situation where Ghanaian unemployed graduates are urged to go to Cote d'Ivoire and teach English, and you have a situation where unemployed graduates of Cote d'Ivoire come to Ghana to teach French, very soon, you have a situation where you are you're using both languages that will affect the employment situation positively. The two will get to know each other better. They will find that they actually they are the same people. And with that, many more things will arise from there. So there are many factors now pushing in the direction of continental free trade area, but you have to stitch, stitch it together softly, softly across countries which are divided by borders, hoping to make the borders now into bridges of cooperation. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, some countries and uh, important economies, such as Nigeria, mm -hmm. are not yet on board. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this will affect the prospect for a successful implementation? I, 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 I have no doubt at all that Nigeria will get on board. You know, Nigeria led this process. There was Professor Osakwe from Onktad in Geneva who spent a lot of his intellectual energies driving the very agreements to bring this about. And I believe there's a certain misunderstanding between Nigerian labor and Nigerian industry that they might become the dumping ground. And so there's this initial hesitation. But I have no doubt that Nigeria will come around because potentially Nigeria has the greatest industrial capacity in West Africa. And they are the country, it is the country most likely to benefit more than most, most people. 
are you optimistic that all the African countries will sign and ratify in the end? I have no doubt at all about that. This is, uh, these are hard economic facts. But you see, we, the, the countries need to see that their lives are getting better. And there's nothing that encourages people better than seeing something in progress and successful. So we, I would say that success will breed more success. So what we have to do is to make sure that um, those who are in it continue. And when the benefits accrue, that will be the greatest uh, emphasis, the greatest uh, encouragement to others to join. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many challenges and obstacles uh, mm -hmm. for successful implementation. Mm -hmm. For you, what is the most uh, silent one, and how could we address it? No, I, I, think, I think the most important is to see it getting into action, you know, and you cannot, you cannot expect uh, progress to come with a big bang. It is what Henry Kissinger calls the slow incremental accretion of strategic advantage. And that's really what is going to come. And then as the momentum builds up, momentum brings more momentum. This is a little physics I learned. <laughs> <laughs> that is well put together. Uh, yeah. So what are your reflections on AGOA uh, Forum? And have you discussed the African yeah. CFTA during yeah, yeah, the day? Yeah. AGOA, AGOA has been interesting in many ways. And again, the question that arose is that the US has given duty-free entry to encourage African produce to the United States. And the question has arisen, why has AGOA, why has the economies, why have the economies of Africa not been transformed the way they expected to? Now, you can talk about free trade. You can talk about facilitating trade. But before you trade, you have to produce. So far, African countries tend to produce just primary, raw, unprocessed products. But to make AGOA more meaningful, African countries need capacity to process, to add value, so that exports that will come to the US market are not necessarily uh, products which are of or little value, like primary products, who, you know, whose price and value tends to vary. Sometimes they go up, they go down, depending on the market. If what we're saying, and that, that was the turn of the discussion in this AGOA forum, was that we need to develop capacity. We need to encourage United States companies to locate in Africa, but they, they, they're not coming there as Father Christmas. They, they're coming there to make profit, and they want to relocate in the place where there's capacity to even to, to man the machinery. That means a certain minimum education. So we in Africa, it's up to us now, first of all, to focus on education and to ensure that our mechanics, our workers are able to man sensitive equipment with accuracy. So we're asking for an Africa where every child is in school, you know, where the cultural educational level, the numeracy level is gone up. Because capital in a place must be able to ensure that it reaches its returns. And to be able to do that, you need workers who are efficient and literate and hardworking and disciplined. Great. And perhaps my, my final question, mm -hmm. uh, can the African CFTA be harmonized with the Trump administration vision of free trade agreement uh, based on uh, mm -hmm. single countries? Yeah, we've been, we've been having discussions with, with um, very senior members of the Trump administration. I had a very interesting discussion with uh, Ambassador Lighthizer just yesterday. And I was trying to point out some of those problems to them. Uh, their argument is that they, they are not going to wait till 
all Africa is united for the entire, the, the, the businessmen, they want to do business now, they want to obtain profit. But we must also recognize that even as you are looking at the larger African market, you have to deal with the reality as it is now. And as you deal with that reality, you have to find ways to improve the situation. So a lot will depend on how quickly African countries themselves ratify and bring this large economic space into reality. You know, so there's, there's work for us to do as well, as much as there's work for the US to do. We also have to ensure that our legal systems are fair and credible, and that if there should be disputes, foreign companies who invest have a fair shake in a court system, which is open, transparent, and credible. So there's work to be done on both sides. And uh, once, once, once you ensure that you have a credible legal system, capital will come in because the rate of return in Africa is higher than everywhere else. On that note, thank you very much, Your Excellency. So can I escape now? <laughs> not yet. Not, <laughs> not yet. yet. Uh, I will now give the floor to the yeah. audience, uh, taking three questions at a time. So, uh, so please, uh, that, that's be a difficult brief part now. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> no comments, okay. just questions. Okay. Okay. Let cool. me start here. And wait for the, the mic, please, and introduce yourself before. First of all, I thank your Excellency for coming. My name is Gustavo Ndala. I'm with the Federation for Free and Democratic Equatorial Guinea. Three questions. We win. So the first question is, for those of us in the diaspora, mm -hmm. we're concerned that the African Union may have been co-opted by China. As you know, there's been rumors that the Chinese bugged the African Union building, and we're concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Second of all, with regard to the future of African leaders, we know that there are many of our, the leaders are of, of Africa, that there's questions of free, fair, and transparent elections. Where does the African Union stand with regard to holding leaders who have been unelected to task so that a new generation of leaders can come in? Thirdly, where do we, where do we go from here as members of the diaspora to be taken seriously by multinational companies and the U.S. government who seem to like the status quo of dictators as opposed to free, fair, and elected leaders? Okay. So can, I, please, can, I, can I respond quickly? Please, only one question and be brief to give the opportunity to order to. I, actually, actually, it's one question, only in three parts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, my brother. Um, I remember the rather alarmist um, article in Le Monde, which says that it sought to give the impression that at the end of the day, all the transactions in the African Union are deciphered in, in Beijing or something like that. The truth is that there's nothing that we are doing in Africa in which is secret. There's nothing which is secret whatsoever. Whoever is interested in finding out is welcome. We're trying to integrate the continent. We're trying to make the continent more receptive to foreign investment, we're trying to uphold human rights, we try to uphold leaders to their word, we're trying to encourage elections, we're trying to prevent coup d'etat. Any, uh, any leader who comes into power under unconstitutional means is automatically suspended. Automatically. So the Chinese can read this every evening if they want, but I don't think it has any value to what they want. So it's not really. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a red herring, in my view, you know. Uh, I suppose this affects the, the issue of free and fair elections. There's the Convention on Democracy and Elections, which ensures, which uh, indicates that any accession to power in an unconstitutional manner you know, results in your automatic uh, suspension. And that is enforced, that is across the board. As to the question of the diaspora, um, the diaspora, as you know, is considered to be the sixth region. Now, the various definitions of the diaspora 
at one remove, you're talking about our brothers and sisters who are taken as slaves to build other people, other countries, the, in Jamaica, Barbados, Brazil, United States, and all that. At another level, you're talking about Africans who have gone now and they're working in, in America or wherever and have acquired citizenship. And of course, you know, they, they have a fondness for the continent, which is sometimes even stronger and more passionate than those of us who are living on the continent. So there are two aspects of it. And we recognize all of them as part of Africa and their investments, their interests is very much welcome. And the issue now that remains is how to channel this into a, a structural manner for, for them to participate in the deliberations and affairs of the AU in a positive manner. That, I believe, is still work in progress. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, hi, um, Valentina Okaru Bison. Um, I had a question. Valentina, where are you from? Oh, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Where in Nigeria? Oh, to remove the issue but, of uh, but, but, ethnic but, but, but stuff. Make me tell me, I'm, I'm interested. Make me I'm, I'm interested. Naturalized US, but my, African, my daughters are married to Nigerian we'll boys. <laughs> I want to know. We'll talk privately later that about so? that one. But I don't want to create, because this is the thing with Africa. Okay. We're always looking to where we're from. Some people think I'm Ghanaian. It's better if we don't really... You know, we are the same people. Yeah, you know? I tend not to want to distinguish mm. myself as okay. to what I am because okay. it's, it makes us all more united, right? Okay. That's what it's all about. Okay, okay. so um, on the question of um, the major challenges mm -hmm. to uh, this, uh, uh, pro you know, the um, implementation CFTA. of mm -hmm. this uh, CFTA, mm -hmm. you said that uh, there were legal, you mentioned the legal, you mm -hmm. also mentioned tariff. Mm -hmm. and then the colonial historical mm -hmm. and capacity. Mm -hmm. But I wanted you to address the question of infrastructural challenges. Mm -hmm. okay. how, will, how should Africa okay. address infrastructure? By infrastructure, I mean just beyond roads, um, water and energy, mm -hmm. and all the other aspects of infrastructure. It's easier for an African yeah. to go from South Africa mm -hmm. to England than to go from South Africa to Mozambique mm -hmm. next door mm -hmm. in terms of trade. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with that? Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a great question. This is relevant. Historically, I'm trying to answer it quickly before I forget, you know, I have gray okay. hairs. Yeah, so. <laughs> Historically, if you look at a place like Ghana, the railway line is from the gold mine to the port or the bauxite manganese mine to the port. It, everything tells a story. You cannot get a railway line connecting Ghana and Togo. It's from where it is to the port. The aim of it is clear, to take the raw material and go. The question of development of the country is of no consequence, no business of them. Um, energy. Uh, between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, we could harmonize and harness our energy resources and together with Nigeria into a West African energy pool. It is now being done. The moment uh, oil and gas was discovered, the borders between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire began to shift and ended up in litigation. Fortunately, that litigation is over, and we are seeking now to harness and mobilize uh, energy resources together. So that is really what we seek to do. But you, 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 you are operating against a system which has been in existence for centuries, and you're now seeking to turn it around. Uh, it's like a large boat. It, it takes a while for it to turn around. But once the consciousness to turn it around is there, you can do it. Now perhaps you can tell me where you come from, Nigeria. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me first change yeah. side, and then I'll come back to this one, please. Thank Give to the uh, server. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Beach, and I'm president of the Africa Business League of America. And I have a question about the business diaspora. Do you think it's reasonable to have the uh, business diaspora receive uh, duty-free uh, exports into uh, Africa as a way to increase uh, trade between America and Africa? And also to see if it's feasible to have business licenses issued by the embassy 
or the uh, AU? How, how will I answer this? For, for, for business exports from the diaspora to Africa without uh, taxes, uh, I believe the uh, revenue authorities might have a different take on that. Um, it's probably something that is worthy of consideration. But if I, if I, if I know how internal revenue people operate, I'd be surprised they look kindly on that. What was the other question? The, whether or not some of the diaspora uh, members have difficulty in getting business licenses in African countries. And the question is whether or not you can do the I think, business licenses here. No, I think that, you do a visa. I think that in, in reality, the reality is that uh, if you want to register a business, yes. you have to come in situ. I don't know whether you are able to register a, a business from outside by electronic means. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. Technology. I, I believe it ought to be possible. But to tell you the truth, I, I don't know how this is done yet. I really don't know. This is something perhaps for uh, uh, business registration centers to think about. But I, I, frankly, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, the lady at the end. Sorry? But there's a gentleman here who wants yeah, to ask a question. To them. Hi, I'm Isa Subian uh, for, with AECOM. Um, I was wondering for the CFTA, uh, what do you have planned as far as like certification or standards? Do you plan on adopting international standards or having your own regional standards? And as far as like certifiers, are each individual countries having their own certifiers? Will you make a certifying body and how that would function? St standards of what? Can you educate me a little bit? Trade standards. You're talking about quality of goods? Yes. I, I, I believe that this is detail. And uh, just off the top of my head, I don't see immediately a Pan-African standard yet. I think uh, what is going to happen is that the consumers of what you produce will probably make a determination of the quality of your product by buying and continue to buy it. And demand and supply will determine whether your standards are up to speed or not. But again, this is detail that I'm not aware of. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the gentleman here wanted to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Your Excellence. Uh, my name is Rin Hui Zhao. I'm an economist at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, so could you share your views on the impact of CFTA on the income inequality within a given African country? And uh, uh, what role does the uh, large informal sector in Africa play in this uh, inequality impact? You, 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 you want to talk about potential impact? Uh, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I, this is very much in the future, and uh, I'm not in the business of predicting the future. I don't think I, I can tell yet. Sure. But what I can say as we sit here is that as the implementation process develops, you know, these things have a, a way of equalizing themselves. But really, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Gentleman yes. here. Sorry, sir. My name is Samuel Fianco Ofori. I'm a banker with Bank of America from Ghana, and I was born and lived all my life in Tema until I came here. Mm -hmm. And Tema is very important because Tema happened to be the best part in Ghana and the gateway of Ghana. I'm so very passionate about... I, 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 li I live in Teshi next door. Okay. <laughs> I work for Central Bank of Ghana, so I was always passing through Teshi okay. for seven years. Okay. I'm very passionate about this discussion mm -hmm. because, Your Excellency, we've been taking for granted for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And I believe for this trade thing to work for Africa, we need revolution. 
we need revelation, actually. Revelation, actually, with... <laughs> See, when you have revelation, there will be revolution. Are you talking about revolution? And fast forward turn around. Are you talking about revolution or revelation? What we are you talking about? Revolution will lead to revelation. I see. Revolution is a fast forward turn around. Okay. But then, and so we have revelation of what we want to do. We won't mm-hmm. do far. I mentioned Tema because, check this out. Mm-hmm. We have 28 lagoons in Tema. Mm-hmm. All over Ghana, we have 28 lagoons. Mm-hmm. We worship them. We pour libation in them. Israel have only one lagoon. And they export You, you pour libation shrimp. in a lagoon? Yes. You do? We do that in Tema in Ghana, unfortunately. No, I'm not aware of that. I know and that's why I said Tema. And your question. Mm-hmm. So what I'm trying to say is that mm-hmm. until we come to a level where we change our paradigm mm-hmm. in the way we behave, this straight thing will go nowhere. Imagine Nigeria, mm-hmm. which happened to be a superpower mm-hmm. country in Africa, has still not joined. So I want to entreat you. Mm-hmm. Help us so that our leaders mm-hmm. will do the right thing for us mm-hmm. so we won't be taken for granted for long. Those of us here, we have become like a laughing stock. Mm-hmm. And that's why we need you, and that's why we need this, mm-hmm. to address some of these problems. Okay. We, need, we need to start by stopping pouring libation in Lagoon, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Stephen Landy, Manchester Trade, playing identif- uh, paying identification politics. I have two grandchildren, Jewish, African-American, 20% Nigerian and 10% Ghanaian. Uh, 10% Senegal, 1% Ghanaian. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. Mm-hmm. And so and I have one very short question, which hopefully will be example for everyone else and mm-hmm. so on. And that is, there is no question that the U.S. will benefit from continental integration, we can set up production units in Africa, we can bring our world-class distribution change, we can do supply chains. It's unbelievably cool for us. What can the United States do as the third country to help you attain your ambitious goals for the, content, uh, for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? Thank you. To tell you the truth, I, I think that the U.S. can help us by developing capacity developing capacity. I mean, the, the U.S. is at the cutting edge of science and technology. And what we're seeking to do in Africa is to leverage science and technology in production, whether agree or whatever, to add value to process. So rather than the U.S. simply importing raw materials, we expect that the U.S. will set up industries within Africa uh, preferably industries who process goods to in, increase in traffic and trade, as well as uh, export, pro- process, finished, value-added scientific goods to the United States. That will mean the U.S. contributing to education in Africa and to governance and all that. Because, you know, capital, capitalism thrives in a situation where governance is good, rule of law is evident and transparent, and the judicial system is fair and free. And politicians come to power as a result of their having been willingly voted into power by their people. That is, they are governing at their behest and in the interest of their people. So there are many ways that the U.S. remains an example to us. We, we believe that uh, where Africa is now, in terms of uh, constitutional arrangements, in terms of this intra-African trade, in terms of this integration process, we are at the point that the U.S. met in Philadelphia in 1776, seeking a much more integrated union, seeking more intra-state trade, which was forged through basically by the Supreme Court you know, in, 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 in ruling against attempts to frustrate intrastate trade. This is really what we're trying to do, seeking to enlarge the economic space and get the a fair playing level, for, a level playing field for everybody. And the U.S. remains the indispensable country and the example par excellence. Perhaps a final question from a lady. Yes. Uh, 
Um, hi, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Karen Etienne. I'm here uh, with the Washington Post, and I'm also of Ghanaian heritage as well from Accra. Um, I'm just wondering with everything that's in the news today about NAFTA, uh, TPP, the European Union, Brexit, whether or not um, the leaders of Africa are sort of looking at perhaps what mistakes or what, uh, uh, what developments that, that has caused this agitation, I guess, against free trade and against uh, these agreements, and what lessons perhaps can uh, the African Union be learning from uh, what's happening uh, with, uh, with the EU, Brexit, um, NAFTA, and uh, just a backlash, I think, against um, multi-country uh, agreements. No, no. Actually, we we are concerned by what appears to us to be a retreat from multilateralism and uh, countries seeking to pursue their interests. A certain kind of bigger than neighbor policy, which is developing. Uh, we, as small countries seeking to develop, we believe that a free and fair international trading system is good for us. A fair tide lifts all boats. And so we are instinctively against any attempt to, to restrict freedom of trade. Now, what we can learn from Brexit was that the campaign for, the great, for great Britain to leave the European Union was very much twisted with a lot of false information. And I think that a lot of that may have been animated by uh, the British people seeing too many non-British seeming to invade their country. In the process, Great Britain who became great precisely because of its adherence to free trade and free movement of people became a country which sought to demonize outside this. Now, in history, any, any country that seeks to expel foreigners and restrict their movement goes down. Because foreigners who come to live in your country are people who really want to come there. And they are almost invariably, they are people who come and work with their heart. That is why the US, as an immigrant country, is such a great success. And that is why any attempt for the U.S. to restrict the flow of immigration, the flow of people, because there are people who will come here and seek to make this country great, will be shooting itself in the foot. The same way that I think Brexit, by, by, by engaging in Brexit, the U.K. shot itself in the foot. And they are beginning to see the results now. Yep. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, for uh, making time to be with us, honoring us with your presence today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.